Good morning and welcome to St. Andrew's United Methodist Church. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I will continue with the life of the church. There will be a council and ministry meeting Monday night by Zoom at 7 p.m. Um, March 3rd and 6th, the Bucks County uh, tax preparation will be um, doing taxes by appointment only. Uh, you can contact them by their website. Tuesday mornings at 9 a.m. and at 7 p.m., our pastor has a Bible study on Acts, and uh, it's not too late to join. We do a chapter each week, and it's very interesting. And a new one started, um, a Lenten Bible study on the book of Philippians, and that's Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. by Zoom. So we hope you'll join us. 
And we also wanted to let you know we will be ordering uh, flowers for Easter. If you have any questions about that, you can contact Carolyn Alvaro. The lilies will be $10, tulips and daffodils, seven. And we will be taking orders for them any time from now until uh, about a week before Easter. And uh, we'd like to thank you for continuing to send in your tithes and offerings for support for the church. Okay, and once again, we come to that time as we go to prayer, we remember the loved ones in our lives, um, those uh, who are suffering from the pandemic in any and all ways, whether it's physically um, or financially, um, whether it's loneliness and struggling to get by. Um, we, we feel for you all and we pray for you and we want God to just embrace you and, and help you through these trying times. And now the times are, um, the trying times are trying to get the vaccine. And a lot of you are probably having had to wait and sit in line and things like that. So it doesn't get any easier, does it? So we want to remember our nation. We remember St. Andrews, our church family, and uh, and all the people in our lives, and we just lift them all up as we come before the Lord in a time of prayer. Father God, we come to you as your people, a people so desperately in need of your faithful and unfailing love. Lord, break up our souls like unplowed ground, for it is time to seek the face of your Son, Jesus as he comes and showers righteousness upon all who love and obey him. Lord, we pray that we would no longer become victims 
of the enemy's lies, nor eat the fruit of deception, having depended on our own strength and our own works. But in sowing repentance, we lay claim upon your covenant that we would indeed reap the fruit of unfailing love. For your blessings, O Lord, we know are showered upon all people who in loyalty and faithfulness proclaim the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who teaches us to pray. Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, thy thy will be done done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, if you'll join me in the responsive reading, which is from Psalm 22, verses 25 to 31. You are the reason I offer praise in the great assembly. I will fulfill my promises before the Lord's loyal followers. Let the oppressed eat and be filled. Let those who seek his help praise the Lord. May you live forever. Let all the people of the earth acknowledge the Lord and turn to him. Let all the nations worship you. For the Lord is king and rules over the nations. All the thriving people of the earth will join the celebration and worship. All those who are descending into the grave will blow before him. Bow before him, I'm sorry. Excluding those who cannot preserve their lives. A whole generation will serve him. They will tell the next generation about the Lord. They will come and tell him about his saving deeds. They will tell a future generation what he has accomplished. Oh, 
66 million years ago. Can any of you remember back that long? Okay. There was a mammal that lived on the island country of Madagascar. And this animal, this mammal, walked the earth in the time of dinosaurs. And the official name of the animal is Adelotherium, which literally means crazy beast. Adelotherium is special because it's so unusual and also so rare. Paleontologists digging at one site in Madagascar found fossils of 20,000 dinosaurs, frogs, and crocodiles, but only 12 mammals. Only 12 mammals. And one of them was the Adelotherium. None of the fossils were as special as this crazy beast. According to paleontologist Patrick O'Connor, the fossil of the crazy beast is a game changer. A game changer. Well, what's so crazy about this beast, you might ask and wonder? Its four limbs were kind of like T-Rex style. They were close together and small, and then the hind legs were bigger, and they were splayed out like, picture a sumo wrestler squatting down. And that's what the upper and lower legs looked like. Now the teeth, the front teeth, never stopped growing. And the weird back teeth looked like they came from an alien. Really interesting, really crazy looking. The skull is unique with a mysterious hole above its snout. No wonder it's called Crazy Beast. It's one of those creatures that scientists and paleontologists consider a missing link or a game changer in the process of evolution. Our friend Paul, in his letter to the Romans, talks about an ancient ancestor. His name was not Adelotherium, it was Abraham. He can be considered as a game changer in the evolution of our faith. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 4, beginning with verse 13. Receive now the word of God. It was not through the law, Paul writes, it was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world. But it was through the righteousness that Abraham had that comes by faith. For if those people who depend upon the law are considered heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression against the law. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offsprings, not only to those who are followers of the law, but also to those who have faith like Abraham did. He is the father of us all. As it is written, quote, I have made you a father of many nations, end quote. He is our Father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into beings that were not. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed. And so he did become the father of many nations, just as it had been promised to him when God said, so shall your offspring be. And without weakening in his faith, Abraham faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. He was a hundred years old. 
and he faced the fact that Sarah's womb was also dead, and yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise that God made to him. But he was strengthened in his faith, and he gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. And this is why we read, quote, it was credited to Abraham as righteousness, it being faith. His faith was counted to him as righteousness. The word, it was credited to him, those words were written not just for Abraham, though, but also for his children, for us, down all of these centuries, to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins, and he was raised to life for our justification. The word of God for you, the people of God. Abraham is not only the ancient ancestor of the Hebrews, of the Hebrews, but he, he's our ancient ancestor as well because of Jesus. Abraham surprised everyone with his focusing on faith instead of on the laws. If strict obedience to obeying the laws was what they worshiped, well, Abraham wasn't following. He did not worship worship. Paul tells us in chapter 4, verse 13, that God's promise to Abraham did not come to Abraham or his descendants because they sought to obey as many of the laws as possible, but it came through the righteousness of faith. During Abraham's day and age, to be considered righteous did mean that you had to be striving to obey as many of the laws as possible, as often as possible. The emphasis is on striving. Focusing on having faith to be righteous wasn't considered, and it was completely unexpected in the ancient world of Abraham, Sarah, and their descendants. So Abraham was an adolatharium, a strange, crazy, game-changing, missing link in the evolution of faith, our faith. When we look at Abraham, we learn that he was saved because of his faith. His trust in God is what made him right with God, making him righteous. And Paul says Abraham's faith was reckoned or counted to him as righteousness. From the time of the spiritual dinosaurs, Abraham filled an important gap in the evolution of the people of God. From the times of the ancient Hebrews to modern day Christians. He showed evidence of having this strong, saving faith, believing in God. He might be an adolatharium, but there was really nothing crazy about him. If we were religious paleontologists and we did a little digging um, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, what do you think we'd discover? Paul wrote Romans to a community that he had never visited. He wanted to, but at the time of his writing, he hadn't. And his words contain a clear and a compelling definition of what we call the gospel. He states that the gospel is, quote, the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. Faith is the heart of Paul's understanding of the gospel. It's the very core. And he uses the word four times in those two verses. But Paul was not the first person to focus on faith. 
When he speaks of the gospel of Jesus Christ, he quotes from one of the Old Testament prophets, Habakkuk. And having grown up a Jew, Paul had learned Habakkuk's writings and words, and the words which say, Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. Archaeologists and paleontologists are always looking to discover and make connections. They uncover one small piece or a large piece, and then they go searching for another, hoping to discover how they fit together with other pieces. And big or small, the pieces do reveal a larger picture. And Paul makes this connection with his spiritual ancestor, Habakkuk, the prophet who Paul understood, and the prophet who understood, as Paul understood, that our spirits are not right until we live by faith. It's not how many laws can we learn and how many laws can we obey and can we go down the checklist and say to someone else, this is how many laws I've obeyed that makes us righteous. It's our faith. It's our faith in God. In the fourth chapter of his letter to the Romans, Paul digs deeper into the power of faith by lifting up the example of Abraham. Abraham was a role model because he believed in God and that was reckoned to him as his righteousness. For thousands of years, that word or that term righteousness was always associated with following a moral code that was based on the law of God. And examples of such moral code are found in the book of Proverbs. For example, Proverbs 13, 5, it says, The righteous hate falsehood. And in 12, 5, the thoughts of the righteous are just. And in 11, 23, the desire of the righteous ends only in good. And Paul wrote in chapter 3, verse 10, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. Looking within himself, he made this confession. I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, my body, for the wishing is present with me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish to do, I do not do. But I end up practicing the very evil that I do not wish to do. Chapter 7, verse 18 and 19. Sin was driving Paul crazy. It was making him nuts. And he needed a new way, uh, <coughs> a, a more stronger, powerful way to be reckoned as righteous. And in place of good works and perfect practicing of the laws, he needed a new approach in order to become right with God. And he found this new approach when he examined the faith of Father Abraham. Paul had found the missing link in his spiritual evolution. And he posed that question to the Romans, what then are we to say that Abraham, our forefather, found according to his own body? He was old. If Abraham was justified by good works and obeying the law, then he has something to boast about, but not before God. Instead of re receiving credit for doing good works, Scripture says Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. By placing his faith in God, God counted him righteous. And Paul wasn't inventing something new because he was doing some digging of his own that he discovered that verse in Genesis about Abraham. That's a game changer. Paul also discovered that Abraham received God's promises through this righteousness of faith. Previously, everyone had assumed that promises came through the strict obedience of the law. But now it is understood that the promises of God for a new future, a better future, and that's where the promises given to Abraham and Sarah, they are available to everyone who has faith and believes in God. 
The challenge is simple. Trust God. Trust the God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. This is good news for all of us because it means that righteousness can be gained by everyone who shares the faith of Abraham. Even if we're not able to keep all the laws, to follow God's law to the letter. For Christians, sharing the faith of Abraham includes having faith in Jesus Christ. That was true for Paul and for all of his descendants in the Christian church. That's us. We're those descendants. We're not descendants of just Abraham, but of Paul as well. Protestant Reformation leader Martin Luther was like Paul. He struggled with his own sin in his life, and it burdened him greatly, so greatly. He wanted to be a good and a righteous person, and so greatly did his sins bother him, whatever they were. He confessed his sins frequently, often every day, and for as long as six hours every day. But after he made these confessions and he would leave the church, he would remember other sins that he needed to confess. And this frustrated Martin Luther, and he realized that he could not become righteous by human effort alone, by good works or human effort alone. And when he read Paul's letter to the Romans and came to verse 17 where it says, The one who is righteous will live by faith. In a flash, Martin Luther realized that he was not made righteous by any or all of his good efforts, but simply by this faith, his faith in Jesus Christ. And Luther wrote, quote, I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. This passage of Paul's became to me a gate to heaven, end quote. The Reformation began when Luther made this discovery about the role of faith in making people right with God. He said, if you have true faith that Christ is your Savior, at once, immediately, you have a gracious God and you should be able to see pure grace and overflowing love. And Luther was inspired to preach the gospel, which means good news. And because he saw that the gospel was the power of God for salvation for everyone who has faith, he had to share it. Faith was the game changer for Abraham, Paul, and Martin Luther. It was the missing link that made them right with God, and it promises to do the very same for everyone else who believes in Jesus Christ, who claims that faith for themselves. Faith is a willingness to trust God and Jesus as you walk beside them or behind them on the path of life. And Abraham put this kind of trust in God, and it says in the scripture, he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body. When he looked in the mirror and he saw that 100-year-old pile of skin and bones, which was already, it says in the scriptures, already as good as dead, said Paul. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, that didn't cause him to give up and say, oh, I missed the boat. Instead, Abraham trusted God to be the one who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. And sure enough, God did what he promised. He made Sarah a mom, and by doing so, he began to make Abraham the father of many nations. When you and I have this kind of faith, we are made right with God for now and eternity. And there's nothing crazy about it. Faith is the biggest game changer in Christian history. Faith makes us right with God through our faith in Jesus Christ. And such faith means that we can trust God to work in us, through us, and even when our bodies fail us. It means we can trust Jesus to lead us even when we wander through a period of difficult moral choices. It means we can trust the Holy Spirit to lift us up 
even when we disappoint ourselves or others. Being righteous does not come from moral perfection, but trying to obey by, or by trying to obey so many laws or by doing so many good works. It's based on being made right with God through our faith in Jesus. <clears throat> when we have faith, we're made right with God both now and eternally. So we can say, praise be to God. That, uh, that sounds like something I want for my own life. Amen. And now receive the benediction. Eternal God, grant us the grace to see your vision of blessings for all of your children. Give us the hope to make your vision real in your world. Provide us with love that knows no limits, least of all the boundaries of poverty, sickness, or death. And may our lives reflect your vision in ways beyond our imaginings. All in Jesus' name, amen.